So once sample hypothesis testing, this is our introduction section. So a hypothesis test is a process that uses sample statistics to test a claim about the value of a population parameter. So just so you have an idea in your head of what kind of examples that would come up, here's one just to visualize. So this one says, consider a manufacturer that advertises its new hybrid car has a mean gas mileage of 50 miles per gallon. If you suspect that the mean mileage is not 50 miles per gallon, how could you show that the advertisement is false? So this section is going to break down all of the components of a hypothesis test. We're going to define each part, look at what builds a hypothesis test, and then we will actually go through the motions of doing one in the next section. So a statistical hypothesis, this is where you're going to state what we think is happening. So there's actually a pair of hypotheses. There's two pieces to it. One is our claim, and then the other is what's called the complement. So if it's, for instance, not 50 miles per gallon, then maybe it's something smaller or something bigger. So for that one, our claim would be it either is 50 or it is not 50. So with equal signs, you have equal and not equal that complement each other. If it is less than for one, it's greater than or equal for the other. So these will always be complements to each other because if one is false, then the other one has to be true. So that's why we make a pair of hypotheses. Now we do have names for them. We call them the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. And they have specific rules. So the null hypothesis, we always write first, H sub zero. This one is always a statement of equality. So it's less than or equal, equal or greater than or equal. It has to have some equal sign in the problem. The second one, the alternative hypothesis, H sub A is inequality. These are our complements. So the complement to less than or equal would be greater than. The complement to equal is not equal. The complement to greater than or equal is less than. These are your complements. And just to reiterate, one of these is going to be your claim. One of these is the complement. Sometimes your claim is HO. Sometimes your claim is HA. That will change from problem to problem. Now this is a great slide to use as a reference later because when you're reading the word problems, it helps to have this visual of which symbols go with which statements. So if you have any of the statements in this side of the chart, this means that this is the symbol for your HO. So at least not less than, no shorter than, greater than or equal. These are all the symbols, all the terms for that symbol, greater than or equal. And then everything on the right hand side, these are all the ways that we could word the less than symbol. So it's the same for each one of these all the way down. So this is a great reference point in case you're ever getting tricked up on which symbol you should be using. This is a great reference point. So we're gonna practice a couple. For each one of these, we're gonna write the claim as a mathematical sentence. So that means we're gonna write HO and HA, and then we're gonna figure out which one is our claim. So for example one, a school publicizes that the proportion of its students who are involved in at least one extracurricular activity is 61%. So we write these as HO, HA. Now, we haven't quite talked about it yet, but when you're doing these problems, you're either gonna have a mean or a proportion. So in this case, we have a proportion, so we use the variable P. If we had a mean, we'd use the variable mu for your population mean. So we're talking about the proportion and we're comparing it to the number 61%. So that is 0.61 when you switch it to a decimal. So when you're trying to figure out, well, what part of this phrasing do I use, always find the number that you're talking about and then look directly in front of it. So it might say more than 
less than 61%. Or in our case, it says is. And is is a tricky one, but is is an equal sign. It's saying that it's not more, it's not less. It is exactly that number. So equal signs always go with HO, so my top row. That means the complement to it is not equals. Now, when it comes to figuring out which one is the claim, the claim is the one that was actually in the wording of your problem. So the fact that this one said is, which is equals, means that my top row is my claim. So this is your null hypothesis. That's your claim. Now let's try it a couple more times. Here's number two. A car dealership announces that the mean time for an oil change is less than 15 minutes. So we're writing H-O-H-A. Notice this time it said mean, so we're going to use mu. And they are claiming that it is 15 minutes. That's what we're comparing. We're comparing to the number 15, and right in front of it, it says less than. Less than does not have an equal symbol with that, so it's going to go in HA. It's one of your inequality symbols. The complement then is greater than or equal. Those symbols should always be pointing in different directions. The top row should always have that or equal to. And because less than is truly the one that's coming directly from the wording of our problem, that means your claim is the HA, which is your alternative hypothesis. All right, one more to try. A company advertises that the mean life of its furnaces is more than eight years. H-O-H-A says mean, so we use mu. 18 is what we're comparing everything to. And directly in front of that, it says more than, which is our greater than symbol. It's an inequality, so it goes in our second row for HA. Complement goes in our top row. And as you'll notice, the first symbol I always write in our HOHA, that one's your claim, because that's the one coming from the wording of your problem. So again, your claim here is the alternative hypothesis. We identify the claim early in the problem because it's going to come back up in our conclusion sentence. We need to know which one is our claim, whether it's HO or HA. Now, regardless of which one is the claim, and again, it will switch, we always go through this process assuming that your null hypothesis is true. So again, that's your HO. So the whole process of a hypothesis test is testing HO. So you're going to go through, and then when you finish, you've tested the number, you've compared the number, you either make one of two decisions. We either say we reject, or we say fail to reject. And oftentimes we will just use that term because we're always talking about the null hypothesis. So typically we just write either reject or we write fail to reject. But again, it's always in reference to the null hypothesis. Now, because we're basing this all on a sample set of data, there is the possibility that we might make the wrong decision based on our numbers. So there's two possible types of error that could occur. Type one error occurs when the null hypothesis is rejected when it's actually true. And type two error occurs if the null hypothesis is not rejected when it is false. Now, in the problems that you are going to solve, you're not going to know if you've committed type one or type two. This would come up from repeated studies, larger sample sizes being pulled, that is not something we are doing in this course. So for the types of problems you're going to see, you're going to have a scenario and they're going to ask you, well, if it was a type 1 error, what happens? Or if it was type 2, what happens? And which one might be worse? So that's what we're going to look at at this next one. This example says the USDA limit for salmonella contamination for ground beef is 7.5%. A meat inspector reports that the ground beef produced by the company exceeds the USDA limit. You perform a hypothesis test to determine whether the meat inspector's claim is true. When will a type 1 or type 2 error occur? Which is more serious? 
So it helps if we write out type one and type, I'm sorry, write out our HOHA real quick. Now the wording order is a little different because we're testing in this case the meat inspector's claim. So his claim is that we are exceeding the limit. So exceed meaning greater than. So we're gonna say our proportion is greater than and switch that percent to a decimal. That's our claim there, is our HA. And then our complement would be less than or equal. So type one error, there's going to be a little bit of a formula to it. So follow along here. We think the contamination contamination levels are greater than 7.5% when they are really less than or equal to. Seven point five percent. So just to read it again, we think those levels are greater than, meaning we have salmonella in our meat, but really they're less than that number. So everything's okay, but we panic. If we think it's going to be a high level of salmonella, we might be pulling that meat and tossing it out. We might have to do a recall from the store. We might create panic when nothing's really wrong. Now type two is the exact opposite here. So the two lines that I underlined in type one, we're gonna flip flop them. So type two is, we think the contamination levels are less than or equal to 7.5% when they are really greater than 7.5%. So type 1 and type 2, you're literally switching what you think and what's really going on. So in this case, type 2, we think the levels are safe. They're less than the level that we would panic about. So we package our meat, we send it to the store, everything seems fine, but actually the meat's all bad. So people might be getting sick, we might have people in the hospital, it's not good. So between the two of these, type one, we're panicking, but there's no reason to panic. Type two, we're not panicking when we should. So type two is definitely the worst one in this situation. Sometimes that flip-flops, depending on the scenario that you're looking at, don't just assume it's always type two. Go through the motions. Figure out what type one is. Flip-flop those two symbols in there to get your type two and then compare them. So another piece of a hypothesis test is level of significance. It's your maximum allowable probability for making a type one error. This is your symbol alpha. And this is going to be given to you in the problem. So you're not having to solve anything for this. It will be clearly stated in the problem. And oftentimes it's one of these three values, 0 0.10, 0 0.05, and 0 0.01. Those are typically the ones we pick and use. So the process of this, just to kind of give you an overview, you're going to state your null and alternative hypothesis. You're going to be given that level of significance from the get-go. And then, in real life, a random sample is going to go out, from take it from the population, sample statistics are going to be calculated, and for that we're talking about a sample mean, a standard deviation value, we're going to gather those stats out. Then we're going to find a critical value, and we're going to place it on our normal curve, so we know where the rejection region is, where we would reject versus the fail to reject. We would calculate with our formula Z or T and find that standardized test statistic, and then we'd make our decision officially, whether we're in that rejection region or not 
And again, we're making the decision about your null hypothesis. So we've kind of mentioned this briefly already. When we're writing our HO and our HA, we use these two symbols right here, our population mean and our population proportion. We are also going to be given the sample. So sample mean, sample proportion. Sometimes you are given the data set and you might have to find these. So you might have to find these. Just as a reminder to find a sample mean, you add up all the numbers, divide by your sample size, to find a sample proportion that is x over n. Now, just as looking ahead, you're going to be using means in the next two sections with z and t based on whether you have a population standard deviation or not. And then our last section for chapter seven we'll cover is proportions, where we use z again. So kind of the same order as when we went through confidence intervals. So something to define is our p-value. It's the probability if the null hypothesis is true of obtaining a sample statistic with a value as extreme or more extreme than the one determined from our sample data. So there's two different ways of solving hypothesis tests. One way you can use p-values. Another way is rejection regions. So when it comes to sketching your graph, there are three different scenarios. There's a left tail, there's a right tail, and there's two tail, and it's completely based on your HA symbol. So you're always going to look at HA once you write your hypothesis to know what kind of shading to do. So this first one, our HA symbol is less than, so it is the left tail. So think less than, left tail. They both start with L. So this would be where our formula, I'm sorry, this is where our critical value is going to be because we are going to be using rejection regions. And then underneath, this is what's called the rejection region. So if we get a number from our formula that's in that blue area, we reject. If it is not in the blue area and it's over here in this yellow area, then we would fail to reject. This is where our decisions would be made. P-value is a little different to use. So in case you look that one up online, it's a little bit of a different method and it will ask you for things differently. So definitely make sure you follow our notes and the examples in my stat lab for when you're going through the motions for a hypothesis test. So again, with this one, HA is greater than. So greater than goes with right tail. Another little shortcut is if you look at that symbol closely and put a little arrow point in there, it's pointing to the side to shade. So you are shading to the right. And when it is the not equals, it could be either both smaller or bigger. So it is both tails. You're shading both ends. And this would be symmetric, so they'd be on the same spot on each side. So real quick, going back to those original three problems we read, we're just going to make a quick sketch. So same as before, this was the students who are in the extracurricular activity. Just as a reminder, your HA was not equals to the 0.61. So not equals means two tail, just like that. And these are truly sketches. Don't feel like you need to pull out a ruler and number along the number line underneath. It's just a sketch. So again, with this one, your HA was less than 15 minutes, less than left tail, and more than 18 years, your HA was greater than. So greater than is right tail. So making a decision, again, if you look up hypothesis tests, there are two different methods of doing them. Using a p-value, where you're comparing your p-value to the given level of significance, 
And then the second method is rejection regions, which we'll talk a little bit more about in the next section. But this is the one that we will be focusing on for, the, for most of our hypothesis tests. So this is the other great chart to have as a reference to come back to later. Remember at the beginning, we figured out what the claim was, whether it was claim is HO or HA. Then once you figured out whether you have rejected or failed to reject, these are your conclusion statements in these little boxes. So this helps you quickly fill in the blanks of what you need to know. If you are rejecting, you always say there is enough evidence, whereas fail to reject is, is not enough evidence. And then the second piece that changes is when your claim is HO, you are rejecting the claim. And when your claim is HA, you support the claim. So these are typically set up as fill in the blank sentences. So here's one just to try. Our claim is HO and we're gonna do both. We're gonna reject and then we're gonna fail to reject. So you can see it. This one was our school publicizes that the proportion of its students who are involved in at least one extracurricular activity is, is 61%. So the full formatting of the fill in the blank goes at blank percent. So this is where your level of significance goes in. At blank percent level of significance. They're blank enough evidence to blank the claim that and then big blank. So this first blank, well, this first blank is your level of significance, which we don't have on this problem because we don't have the full thing. But you would plug that in back as a percent value from a decimal. This second blank over here, they're blank enough evidence. This is where you're either going to write is or is not, depending on if you've rejected or failed to reject. So if we reject first, We'll put in there is enough evidence to, and this is coming from your claim. So because HO is our claim, we use the term reject. So this is either reject or support the claim that, and this last big blank is going to come back from the wording of the problem. So it always is going to say something like so-and-so claims that, publicizes that, states that, and then everything after that to the period would go in this blank. So that the proportion of its students who are involved, I'm going to put dot, 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 fill in the rest of the sentence all the way down to the is 61%. That's that last blank. It is the context of the problem. And within that, you can see that it's a proportion, you can see what symbol we use, you get a lot of information pieces from just copying that directly in. So again, these are all of your steps in order of what we're gonna be doing. You're gonna write your HOHA and figure out which one is the claim. Then you're going to be given your level of significance, you just copy it down. You are going to figure out what type of test so I call it the what test and why. So you're figuring out whether it's Z or T and then checking conditions there. And then you make your sketch, figure out how we're going to shade it. So remember looking at HA to figure out the shade. Critical value, we did in our last chapter, that's your inverse norm or inverse T. So figure that value out, add it to your sketch. Then you're gonna find the standardized test statistic. This is your big formula. So this, there's gonna be a different formula for each section that we cover. And then once you have it, you're gonna check it back to your graph. So just as a quick reminder, wherever the shading is at, that's what we call the rejection region. And then the not shaded area, we call fail to reject. So this is like on a left tail test, Wherever that shading is at is where we reject. 
So if we get something from our formula that is in that area, we would reject. If it's not in the area, we say fail to reject. That's how we're going to make our decisions. And then we write our statement at the end. So that fill in the blank sentence. 